It would seem that the solar system has been studied by mankind, if not completely, then in full detail. The planets have all been identified for a long time. Rovers have been traveling on Mars for a while. Comets and asteroids have been almost counted by name. And even the soil from one of them was taken and delivered to Earth for research. But this is where the scientists were dumbfounded. It turns out that our entire solar system, including the far, far away Oort cloud, located at a distance of a light year from the Sun, is immersed in a giant bubble. Its diameter is 1,000 light years. And what is remarkable, our Sun is practically in the center of this bubble. Are we really living in a huge bubble? And how does our solar system actually work? In 1977, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 launched from Cape Canaveral, less than a month apart. By the way, Voyager 2 launched earlier, but since it had a different flight path, it flew to the edge of our solar system second, six years after its colleague. Both devices found a very strange anomaly. As you move away from the Sun, the density of space increases. Interstellar space is usually considered a vacuum, but this is not entirely true. The density of matter is extremely low, but it still exists. In the solar system, the solar wind has an average density of protons and electrons of 3 to 10 particles per cubic centimeter, but it's lower the farther from the Sun. The smallest density of space is at the edge of the solar system. This boundary is called the heliopause. On it, the speed of the solar wind, the flow of charged particles emitted by the Sun, or in other words, solar plasma, drops to zero. The area between the Sun and the heliopause is called the heliosphere. This is a kind of bubble in which all the planets of the solar system are immersed. At this boundary, the density of protons and electrons is 0.002 particles per cubic centimeter. According to calculations, the density of particles behind the heliopause, that is, in interstellar space, should be 0.037 particles per cubic centimeter. The Voyager 2 instrument showed that the density outside the solar system, at a distance of 119.7 astronomical units or 17.9 billion kilometers from the Sun, was 0.039 particles per cubic centimeter. This almost coincided with the calculations. But then the strangeness began. At a distance of 124.2 astronomical units or 18.5 billion kilometers, the density was 0.12 particles per cubic centimeter. Why is the density increasing? We'll definitely talk about this a little later, but for now, let's talk about another bubble, much larger than the heliosphere, so that you'll appreciate all the thoughtfulness of the cosmos that packed us into two bubbles at once and understand the relationship between them. When you look at the pictures of deep space, you get the impression that it's filled with clouds of interstellar dust and luminous gas. But back in the 70s and 80s of the last century, astronomers began to pay attention to the fact that the galactic space around the Sun differs from this picture. The solar system seemed to hang in an almost absolute void. This year, scientists at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics CFA, proved that yes, we really are in a kind of void. They conducted the most complex computer simulations, creating a three-dimensional reconstruction of space and time. The study showed that the Sun and Earth are located almost in the center of a giant bubble with a diameter of 1,000 light years, which they called the local bubble. According to calculations, it began to form about 14 million years ago. For this, it's necessary that about 15 supernovae explode over several million years. This series of explosions pushed the interstellar gas outward with the pressure of light, creating a bubble-like structure with a dense surface at the boundary. And now, the bubble continues to grow in size. When the bubble first formed, it was expanding at about 60 miles per second. According to data collected by the European Space Agency's Gaia Space Observatory, at present, the bubble is still expanding at 4 miles per second. On its surface, seven star formation regions were detected, dense molecular clouds where stars are formed. The process of star formation occurs everywhere on the surface of the local bubble, and there are many such bubbles in the galaxy. 
Therefore, it's possible that there are other stars, even with planets, which, like us, are also in their local bubbles. Interestingly, the Sun was not at the center of our universe at first. When these catastrophic explosions occurred, the Sun was far away from the scene, about 1,000 light years away. But, as Joao Alves, an astrophysicist at the University of Vienna, explained, about 5 million years ago, as it orbited the center of the galaxy, the Sun got almost right at the center of the bubble. This is consistent with estimates of radioactive iron isotope deposits from a supernova in the Earth's crust from other studies. The researchers suggest that there are probably more star formation bubbles in the Milky Way. Research author and astronomer of CFA, Elisa Goodman, who founded GLU, explains in her statement that, statistically, the Sun would not be near the middle of a huge bubble if they weren't spread all over the place. The local bubble is exactly the bubble we're in right now, she said. We think the Sun has probably gone through a lot of superbubbles in its history. The scientists compared the cosmos with Swiss cheese. The holes in the cosmos are punched out by supernova explosions, and new stars are being formed on the edge of the holes created by dying stars. The research team plans to map more cosmic bubbles to get a full 3D representation of their shape, location, and size. By charting out where the bubbles lie across the vast expanse of space, astronomers can piece together how these bubbles act as nurseries for stars, how the bubbles interact with each other, and how galaxies like the Milky Way have evolved over time. With the opening of the local bubble, the structure of the solar system looks like this. At its center is the Sun, around which eight planets revolve. The last one is Neptune, at a distance of about 4.45 billion kilometers, or 30 astronomical units. That is 30 times farther from the Sun than the Earth. Behind Neptune is the Kuiper Belt, a collection of small celestial bodies, the most famous of which is Pluto, which has long been considered a planet. The Kuiper Belt stretches out to about 55 astronomical units. Further, at a distance of 125 to 135 astronomical units, there is a heliopause, which we've already described. Let us now explain why the density begins to increase at its boundary. It's because solar plasma collides with interstellar plasma here. Imagine two streams colliding head-on at cosmic speeds. Of course, at the point of collision, the density increases. It's like a traffic jam, a chaos of particles. And behind this jam, at a distance of 0.75 to 1.5 light years, the Oort cloud spreads, a spherical cloud of ice objects up to a trillion, which serves as a source of long period comets. The interstellar wind already dominates here, but the Sun is still holding bodies in its gravitational field with its last strength. Of course, many of our viewers may ask the question, well, we're in a bubble that's huge by earthly standards, even in a double bubble, local and heliosphere. Well, so what? How does this affect our lives? About that small bubble, the heliosphere, we can say unambiguously that thanks to it, thanks to the traffic jam that formed on its border, the Earth is reliably protected from high-energy cosmic particles rushing from the center of the galaxy. Now for the local bubble. Scientists have long found out that our galaxy, the Milky Way, has the shape of a spiral disk. Several spirals diverge from its center, which astronomers call arms. Right now, our Sun is almost halfway between the Sagittarius arm and the Perseus arm. And our Sun revolves around the center of the galaxy. It makes one revolution in 200 million years. We call this a galactic year. Only 0.0008 of this year has passed since the appearance of man. In its path, the Sun, with all its planets, crossed not only bubbles, but also accumulations of interstellar gas, when the density of matter in space jumped hundreds of times. Astrophysicist Miroslav Filipovich, using the latest model of the Milky Way, checked what happened on Earth when the Sun crossed the galactic arms in which the density of interstellar space is much higher. A relationship has been found between the time the Sun crossed the spiral arms and five known mass extinction events, 415, 322, 300, 145, and 33 million years ago. So we can assume that now the Sun is in a quiet harbor, favorable for all living things. 
And we can say that humanity is very lucky that we appeared on Earth as a species when the sun flew into the local bubble before that. Or maybe these two events are somehow connected. The appearance of man and the presence of the sun in a safe haven, the local bubble. Science has no information about it, at least not yet. But we can definitely say that we observe such a colorful sky above our heads only due to the fact that we're practically in a void, the local bubble. If the space around us was denser, many stars would be invisible. And who knows if we would know about space and about the structure of the universe as much as now if we were literally in the dark. And we can say that the local bubble is just a gift to humanity, which has entered the space age and is already trying to jump to the stars. For an interstellar craft moving at subliminal speeds, the greatest threat is dust particles, which will simply grind the ship to powder during collisions. Even hypothetical concepts such as ships imply a frontal shield. But now, it turns out that the cosmos seems to have taken care of us. It removed the dust in the vicinity of the sun and, as it were, says, forward guys, the path to Alpha Centauri and Tau Ceti is open. As we learn new things about something, we start to believe we know a lot about it. But this isn't often the case with space. Our solar system is much, much bigger than you'd expect, and you'd be surprised how little we know about it. But soon, with the launch of a next-generation telescope, that might change. Does this mean we would finally detect an elusive Planet 9? Will we find some other secrets our solar system has stored for us? And would it all change the way we perceive our place in the cosmos? Now, get ready to discover answers to this and more. Referred to as Planet 9, but sometimes referred to as Planet X before Pluto's reclassification, this is an elusive world orbiting far beyond Neptune. It's been a mystery for scientists for decades. Since the beginning of the 20th century, astronomers suspected the existence of a large body affecting Uranus and Neptune. But once Voyager 2 approached Neptune in 1989 and sent us back data, it became clear we had wrong calculations. It turned out there was nothing weird about the two gas giants. It looked as though the hunt for Planet X came up empty. But that wasn't the end. Just recently, one curious scientist decided to look through the 38-year-old data from the Infrared Astronomical Satellite, the very first telescope that managed to scan about 96% of the night sky. And among about 250,000 point sources, there were three specifically interesting ones. But how do you look for something in our solar system? If you take a telescope and look in a specific direction of the night sky, you'll see a bunch of dots. Some of those are distant stars, and some are solar system objects. So how do you distinguish one from the other? You look at an object's motion. If it barely moves or doesn't move whatsoever, the chances are it's located quite far. But if an object travels a significant distance in space within a relatively short period of time, it means it's close enough in our solar system. Only one out of three objects from the IRAS data that met astronomers' requirements was captured moving through space. This is when the scientific community became thrilled. If the IRAS data is right, a planet we've been looking for should be three to five times as massive as Earth and orbit at a distance of approximately 225 astronomical units, one AU being the distance from Earth to the Sun, which is 149,597,870.7 kilometers. But the other two scientists involved in the search didn't agree with that conclusion. However, they found yet another theory of Planet Nine's existence, and once again, the search got a new course. On the outskirts of our solar system lie six space bodies called extreme trans-Neptunian objects. And they aren't just some random objects. They all have one thing in common that makes scientists curious. All six of them have an orbit pointing in one direction. And because the chances of such distant space bodies with such an alignment are roughly 0.007%, we know there's something causing it. A gravitational influence of a much larger body somewhere out there. All the strange phenomena could be explained by a planet two to four times the radius of the Earth, and almost as massive as Neptune. It would also have a highly eccentric orbit, getting close to our Sun at about 200 AU and then moving away at a mind-blowing 1,200 AU. 
such an elongated orbit would have a 20,000-year orbital period. The only thing scientists lacked to make their theory look promising were several objects with even stranger elongated orbits. But as it turns out, another astronomer has just discovered such objects exactly where this theory would predict them to be. Still, knowing Planet Nine's orbit doesn't tell you where on its orbit it currently is. Nevertheless, there are things that scientists know for sure, and by means of pure logic and mathematics, they could make predictions on where to look for it. For example, at its nearest point to the Sun, Planet Nine has a brightness of 18th magnitude, so if it recently was that close to us on its orbit, it would have been easily spotted. And because of that, we think it's closer to its furthest point, where it's as faint as 25th magnitude, which makes it harder to notice. How bright is that? The smaller the number, the brighter the object. To compare, Pluto's average magnitude is approximately 15. Thankfully, 25th magnitude is still in the range of what the Hubble Space Telescope is able to detect. This is 10 billion times fainter than the human eyes can see. So, while we don't know for sure where it is, we have decent proof to think it's there. You may think it's impossible to find such a distant object given the data we have, but we've already found a planet based on our predictions once – Neptune. Astronomers of the past believed something was tugging Uranus, but they couldn't find any reasonable explanation. Later, one scientist, using classical celestial mechanics, made a prediction on the location of a hypothetical planet that was supposed to be in charge of what was happening to Uranus. Using those calculations, astronomers were able to locate Neptune exactly where it was predicted to be in just one night. But while Neptune orbits our Sun at about 30 astronomical units, Planet Nine is expected to be much further away. Because of the great distances and how dim Planet Nine is, our chances aren't that high. But that could change very soon. A new generation of telescopes are on their way, and one of them is currently being built in Chile. Scheduled to begin operations in the fall of 2023, this is going to be an 8.4-meter telescope with a 3200-megapixel camera on board. The camera, the size of a car, is going to be the largest camera constructed for astronomical purposes. With such a tool, scientists could not only verify if Planet Nine actually exists, but also find roughly 20 terabytes worth of space objects and other phenomena in one night. Just in a year, the observatory will be able to capture more of the cosmos than all the telescopes on Earth ever did combined. This can turn our perception of the universe and our place within it upside down. If you'd like to see a full video about this telescope and what it could find, make sure to let us know. But what if we scan every point of the sky where Planet Nine could be and find nothing? Well, there's an idea that Planet Nine could be mistaken for a primordial black hole that would cause similar gravitational effects. Although it's purely hypothetical as we haven't detected one yet, at the very dawn of the universe, when everything was much denser and hotter, primordial black holes popped in and out of existence within just a second, and depending on when during that second such a black hole was born, its mass could have been as little as 5 to 10 grams, or as enormous as 100,000 solar masses. The thing is, if our calculations about an elusive planet's mass are correct, a primordial black hole a few times the mass of Earth would only be the size of a grapefruit, or even smaller than a human fist. And if that's the case, we've no chance of finding it with a telescope, ever. Although we may just detect it with the more aggressive method. The idea is to send hundreds or even thousands of small laser-propelled spacecraft and test the gravitational field of a possible primordial black hole. Even if just a few of these tiny spacecraft pass a black hole at a distance of tens of astronomical units and sends us back data, it would be enough. But how would we know if we were right? We could figure out if a black hole is really out there by measuring intervals between those signals. If it's there, the signals will lengthen under the gravitational influence of this mysterious object. Yes, Planet Nine has a lot of theories surrounding it, and even that isn't the last one. After all, Planet Nine could have once been a rogue planet, or such that was freely wandering through space without a stable orbit. And sometime in the past, it could have been captured by our star's gravity. That may seem unintuitive to you, but some studies show that in our galaxy there are more planets unattached to a star than those orbiting one. What's interesting is that, according to simulations, in 60% of cases, rogue planets just enter a solar system and leave it. But in 1 out of 10 cases, 
such a planet could take another planet with it on its way out. But there's also a 40% chance that a rogue planet won't be able to escape a solar system once it enters it. That is one possibility of what Planet 9 could be. Besides, we've already discovered some rogue planets in the past. Looking for such worlds is no easy task. A rogue planet, a star behind it, and an observer should be aligned almost perfectly. And the only way we know if it's there is if gravity bends the light emitted by a star behind it when a planet flies past it. Two such events with perplexing names became promising rogue planet candidates. One of them is suggested to have a mass range between Neptune and Earth, while the other one could be as massive as Jupiter or even as a brown dwarf. Not so long ago, the Kepler Space Telescope possibly detected four new Earth-sized rogue planets wandering through our Milky Way. So far, we don't know much about rogue planets, but what's interesting is that some scientists think they can actually be habitable. But how could a planet that doesn't get enough light sustain life? Well, there are three possible scenarios – subsurface oceans, tidal heat, and an active galactic core. The odds for life on the surface of such space objects are close to zero. That's true. Subsurface oceans, on the other hand, could not only host microbes, but something bigger as well. A rogue planet's interior or its highly dense hydrogen atmosphere would trap some heat and prevent these oceans from freezing. Even within our solar system lies a frozen object that has liquid water on it – Europa, Jupiter's moon. A massive moon surrounding such a planet could also cause tidal heating. Under the right circumstances, if a smaller celestial body orbits a much larger one at close distance, the gravitational pull of a larger body would distort the shape of a smaller one, and, similar to the way a piece of wire heats when you bend it, it would heat that object. A rogue planet travelling through space near an active galactic nucleus would also be able to get enough light from the centre of a galaxy. And as long as a rogue planet stays within 1,000 light-years from the galactic core, it could even sustain photosynthesis. Our solar system is a strange place, with its four giant worlds and four smaller planets. To scientists, this looks odd, as if something was missing. And what are the chances that astronomers working centuries apart repeatedly come to the exact same conclusion? There is something there. Well, far, far out, the most distant object ever found by a human being in our solar system is just some 130 AU away. Add another 1,000 AU to that number and you arrive at the farthest point of Planet Nine's orbit. So there's still a long way till we master our searching abilities, but hopefully Vera Rubin Observatory will be a huge step towards finding out more about the mysterious place we live in. According to astronomers' estimates, Pluto is just about 2,370 kilometers in diameter which makes it smaller than a number of solar system moons such as Ganymede, Titan, Callisto, Io, the Moon, Europa, and Triton. And this made scientists wonder if Pluto could still be considered a planet. To compare, it's almost 60 times smaller than Jupiter. So scientists were skeptical about Pluto's status as a planet. The small world was rather just a part of the population of small icy bodies beyond the orbit of Neptune, or the region known as the Kuiper Belt. But it wasn't until 1992 that astronomers discovered its first resident. The space object, dubbed 1992 QB1, was found using a 2.24-meter telescope on Mauna Kea, the island of Hawaii. The discovery of this celestial body further intensified discussions on the status of Pluto. Eight years later, the New York Hayden Planetarium presented a scandalous exhibition that featured just eight planets. Then, scientists discovered more Kuiper Belt objects with a mass roughly that of Pluto, such as Kuawa, Sedna, and Eris. And the newly discovered Eris turned out to be even larger than Pluto. First, this Kuiper Belt object was even called the tenth planet of the solar system. Eventually, the International Astronomical Union created a committee to establish a general definition of a planet. One idea was to extend the list of solar system planets from 9 to 12. It was proposed that Pluto, along with its satellite, should be considered twin planets, and Ceres and Eris had to join a planetary list as well. But the idea was criticized and rejected. Eventually, a new definition of a planet was created. On the last day of the meeting, August 24th, members of the IAU defined criteria for a celestial body to be called a planet. 
So what are these criteria? To be a planet, a space object must be in orbit around the Sun. It must have sufficient mass and gravity to force it into a spherical shape, and it must also be able to clear away any other objects of similar size near its orbit. And there are just eight such planets in our solar system, starting with Mercury and ending with Neptune. So because Pluto only meets the first two criteria, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet or planetoid. It all started when the New Horizons approached the dwarf planet located almost at the edge of the solar system. Scientists have long been interested in Pluto. Even such an advanced device as the Hubble Space Telescope could only see a few bright spots on this planet. And the most thrilling part about Pluto was its location, the Kuiper Belt. This region of space consists of a bunch of icy bodies of various sizes. Scientists think these are the remnants of the solar system building blocks. So, studying Pluto could help us better understand how our solar system and our home planet were formed. And in 2003, scientists were able to convince NASA to organize an expedition to Pluto. Three years later, the New Horizons probe atop the Atlas V carrier rocket was launched from the US Space Force Station at Cape Canaveral. But just days before approaching Pluto, the spacecraft stopped communicating with Earth, and scientists had to urgently reboot its software. Then the probe faced even more issues when it approached Pluto. Despite its small size, the dwarf planet has five satellites, the largest of which is roughly half the planet's size. But astronomers were worried that the planetoid could be also surrounded by swarms of tiny satellites that could form rings, like those around Saturn or Jupiter, but much smaller. A collision with such a satellite, or even a dust particle the size of a grain, at a speed of almost 16 kilometers per second, would mean a disaster for the mission. It would cause the energy of a collision equal to a large caliber gun projectile and blow the probe to pieces. But everything worked out well, and mankind was finally able to see the first photos of the dwarf planet. As project manager Professor Alan Stern stated, it exceeded my wildest expectations in every way. I'm delighted. The Pluto system is simply stunning. Another participant of the project, Professor Hal Weaver, said, Our jaws just dropped. That was incredible. Who wouldn't have thought that a cosmic body that receives just one sixteen hundredth of sunlight compared to Earth and is three billion miles away from the Sun can be so beautiful? Interestingly, Pluto, among all other cosmic bodies in our solar system, is most similar to Earth. Scientists were shocked to see frozen icy lakes, icy mountains the size of the Rocky Mountains, and chasms larger than the Grand Canyon. And all that is on a planet smaller than the Moon. What's more, like Earth, Pluto also has a blue atmosphere. But unfortunately, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere of the dwarf planet just nitrogen and numerous deposits of methane and carbon monoxide. The pressure there is about 1 pascal, which is about 100,000 times less than that of our planet. The average surface temperature is minus 226 to minus 240 degrees Celsius. Scientists were also intrigued by Pluto's smooth surface, almost round in shape, occupying about a third of the entire area of the planet. Its diameter is 1,492 kilometers. The area named Sputnik Planeta has practically no craters on it, meaning there are no traces of meteorite impact. Scientists believe it was formed relatively recently, during the last 100 million years or so. Further analysis showed that this is a large basin filled with frozen nitrogen. But for now, let's take a look at Pluto's main satellite. Charon is located at a distance of about 19,600 kilometers from the surface of Pluto, while the distance between the Earth and the Moon is roughly 385,000 kilometers. This means that the tidal forces between the dwarf planet and its satellite are very powerful. And according to the laws of celestial mechanics, under such conditions, the rotation of a satellite becomes synchronized in time, meaning the period of its revolution around its axis and a planet becomes the same. That is, Charon is always facing Pluto on one side. Now let's get back to Sputnik Planeta. 
This area is located on the axis connecting the centers of Pluto and Charon, and the probability that such a large geological formation lies on this axis by chance is about 5%. Most likely, sometime in the past, a pole shift occurred on Pluto and Sputnik Planeta took the place of one of the poles. But for this to be possible, this region should have had a positive gravitational anomaly. In other words, it must be heavier than the average volume of Pluto. But Sputnik Planeta is a hollow basin filled with light ice, frozen nitrogen. And this made scientists think that there may be a denser substance under its surface that adds mass to the area. So, what is this substance? Scientists got interested in the deep cracks that are clearly visible on the surface of Sputnik Planeta. These cracks usually form as the planet's surface expands, and as the temperatures on the surface of Pluto are freezing, there must be a substance beneath the frozen nitrogen crust that expands when it cools down. So what kind of substance can expand rather than contract when it gets cooled? Water. So, does this mean that there's an ocean of liquid water hiding underneath a layer of frozen nitrogen in this giant basin? That's what scientists thought and later confirmed by another observation. Geologists studied three-dimensional maps of the surface of Pluto and identified two quite unusual objects. Mountains up to five or six kilometers high. But these aren't just mountains. Scientists have also found a billion-year-old volcanic craters and textures resembling traces of ancient eruptions on their surface. The two gigantic volcanoes were named Wrightmons and Picardmons. If scientists are right that these geological formations of volcanoes, Wrightmons and Picardmons, are the first large cryovolcanoes discovered in the solar system. But so far, scientists aren't 100% certain about the nature of these objects. They definitely look suspicious, so we're looking at them closely, says Jeff Moore, a member of the mission's science team. But these volcanoes are on the outskirts of Sputnik Planeta, so it's very likely that this is the case. Perhaps in the past, Pluto had two cryovolcanoes that erupted with icy water instead of lava. As for Sputnik Planeta, scientists think that this was formed as a result of a cosmic catastrophe. A large celestial body once fell on Pluto, resulting in a crater with an initial depth of about 7 kilometers. The collision caused a significant decrease in the thickness of the dwarf planet's icy surface and also made water from the subsurface ocean rise. Geologists have also considered yet another idea. Pluto could have no subsurface ocean at all. In this case, for a positive gravitational anomaly to occur, huge amounts of nitrogen ice must accumulate in the impact crater. And amounts that big wouldn't simply fit into the crater. Scientists say that the depth of the ocean on Pluto should reach 100 kilometers, and that it's existed for billions of years. Large quantities of ammonia and methanol could help maintain the subsurface ocean in a semi-liquid state. Scientists are almost certain that the subsurface ocean isn't completely frozen, because if it were, Pluto's low temperatures and high pressure inside the planetoid would make water ice turn into denser cubic, or ice too. This would have been accompanied by a decrease in the volume of ice and compression of Pluto's icy crust, but the images taken by the New Horizons show a different picture. This means that the ocean may still be partly liquid. Something similar even happens here on Earth. Our planet also has a region with very low temperatures, and there's a reservoir with liquid water under its surface. This is the famous Lake Vostok, with a maximum depth of 1,200 meters and an area of 15,790 kilometers squared. But how did Pluto, despite its great distance from the Sun, get enough heat to create a liquid ocean that survived under the icy crust up to this day? Scientists believe two potential sources made it possible. The first one is the heat released during the decay of radioactive elements inside the dwarf planet, and the second one is the gravitational energy release resulting from the bombardment of Pluto's surface. Calculations show that if all gravitational energy was stored as heat, this source alone would be enough to create a liquid ocean. However, for this to happen, the accretion process must be very fast. Otherwise, a planetary body's surface would give off a significant part of the energy back into space. Researchers calculated that to heat up so quickly, Pluto must have formed in about 30,000 years. 
Scientists suggest that some other large Kuiper Belt objects, such as the dwarf planets Eris and Makimaki, also had a hot start and had liquid oceans at the very beginning of their existence. So far, it seems humanity only looks for water millions of light years away, while it's always been much closer in our solar system. And water often means life. So there's a high probability that life could one day be found in the depths of Pluto. Even on our planet, there are life forms that can survive without heat from the sun. Some bacteria live in thermal springs and survive because of the heat incoming from hot water. In science, there's even the concept of extremophiles, or organisms capable of living and reproducing in extreme environmental conditions, such as very high or low temperature, pressure, acidity, oxygen, and so on. So why wouldn't there be life in Pluto's underground ocean? The great English science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke predicted life in the subsurface ocean on Jupiter's satellite Europa in his famous novel 2001 A Space Odyssey. This celestial body is larger than Pluto, and it receives more heat from the Sun. So even though this is just a prediction, the same author was already right with yet another forecast. During the New Horizons mission, the probe's flight path was calculated according to the method described by the great science fiction writer in his novel. The idea is to use Jupiter's gravitational field as an additional source of acceleration to save fuel. According to the creators of the New Horizons project, such a maneuver allowed the device to arrive at Pluto three years earlier. To scientists' surprise, the dwarf planet turned out to be similar to our home. Like Earth, Pluto has a blue halo of atmosphere around it, although a subsurface one. It also has an ocean, and the existence of certain life forms there is very likely. So the debate about whether Pluto should have a status of a planet is back on the table because it seems like the planet deserves it. But it also deserves another mission. We have to land on Sputnik Planeta, get to liquid water, and finally put an end to the question of whether life is present there or not. This could be the greatest discovery since the beginning of the third millennium. But Our ancestors knew the monstrous size of Jupiter. The gas giant's mass is two and a half times the total mass of all the other planets in the solar system, and 317.8 times the mass of the Earth. Jupiter's volume is 1,300 times larger than our planets. But today, we've advanced technologies that help us learn more about the gas giant than just size and mass. And astronomers pay a lot of attention to the study of Jupiter, as our planet's future depends on it. The latest data we have shows that, right now, something strange is happening with the planet. Jupiter is considered the super vacuum cleaner of the solar system by astronomers because of its immense gravity well and where it orbits in the inner solar system. The gas giant has taken some huge impacts from asteroids that could have hit Earth in the past, like Shoemaker-Levy 9, which slammed into Jupiter as it broke into pieces in 1994. But the planet's gravity isn't always protecting us. Along with Venus, it affects the Earth's climate. Every 405,000 years, gravitational fluctuations between Earth, Venus, and Jupiter bring us abnormally cold winters and hot summers. Droughts become severe, and rains cause floods. Researchers say we're now somewhere in the middle of this cycle. And if something goes wrong on Jupiter, it could affect Earth in a big way. So what is the weird thing going on with Jupiter? For once, its most famous storm seems to be shrinking, and we have no idea how that will affect the planet. The Great Red Spot is a huge anticyclonic storm on Jupiter. The largest storms on Earth are more than 1,600 kilometers across, with winds reaching up to 320 kilometers per hour. But these hurricanes pale in comparison with the Great Red Spot anticyclone which is about 16,000 kilometers in diameter. The gigantic storm is circling Jupiter at 650 kilometers per hour. Astronomers discovered the Great Red Spot in the 17th century, and scientists still study this phenomenon. The distinctive color of Jupiter's Great Red Spot has been a mystery for a long time. Some scientists believe the storm is colored by complex organic compounds. The whirlwind lifts them from the inside of the planet into the upper layers of the atmosphere. Others think the rusty color comes from sunlight splitting up different chemicals in the anticyclone's upper atmosphere. If so, the storm isn't actually very red at all, 
and what we might see is just a sort of sunburn at the top of it. Another interesting question is why the anticyclone lasts so long. Scientists have suggested it's because of Jupiter's composition, which is mostly hydrogen and helium. The gas giant has no solid surface to frictionally weaken the storm. On Earth, friction reduces the wind speed near the surface. This slows down storms. But other planets in our solar system aren't like the Earth either. Saturn, for example, isn't rocky, and storms there don't last this long. The biggest storm on Saturn, the Great White Spot, covers several thousand kilometers. You can see it through a telescope as a white oval. This spot appears every 30 years and then vanishes without any trace. The big dark spot on Neptune, which was discovered in 1989, was also proved to be short-lived. The wind around the storm reached supersonic speeds of up to 2,400 km per hour. The large dark spot was constantly changing its shape and size. With that much activity, the storm was clearly not going to subside. And yet, in 1994, it disappeared. But let's get back to the Great Red Spot. The Juno spacecraft passed over the anticyclone twice in 2019. It took images of the storm to help determine its nature. Using Juno's data, scientists compiled a three-dimensional model of Jupiter. It showed that the Great Red Spot extends much deeper than previously thought. On Earth, a storm of this size would rise above the International Space Station. Researchers say that, taken from above, the cyclone looks like a huge pancake, but a really thick one, going 500 kilometers deep into the clouds of Jupiter. This is 50 to 100 times deeper than the Earth's oceans. The storm is powered by atmospheric jets that go far deeper, about 3,000 kilometers. Scientists are still trying to unravel the mechanism behind how these jets move. So far, there's only one clue from the spacecraft data. Atmospheric ammonia gas is moving up and down in the jets. This is very different from the way things happen on Earth. On our planet, atmospheric phenomena are largely driven by water, clouds, condensation, and sunlight. This is what we'd probably see inside the Great Red Spot if we could get there. The gravity there would be intense. The Juno spacecraft passing over the Great Red Spot was like driving a car on a road full of potholes. Radio waves reaching Earth were slightly compressed and stretched. Thanks to this effect, scientists picked up tiny tremors, 0.01 millimeters per second, and were able to calculate the gravity inside the storm. It turned out to be so strong as if a mysterious planet was hiding at the bottom of the anticyclone. But of course, scientists didn't find any planet there, only a gas surface. Meanwhile, new measurements from the Hubble Space Telescope show that the storm has changed its form from oval to round and shrunk considerably. Previously, three Earths would fit inside the monstrous storm, but now only one. Look at these Hubble Telescope images from 1995, 2009 and 2014. You can see how the Great Red Spot has shrunk in just 19 years. So why is the storm on Jupiter shrinking? And do we have anything to worry about if the storm disappears? According to researchers, something in the planet's atmosphere is killing the storm. An unknown force is tearing apart the Great Red Spot. In May 2017, the Gemini North Telescope spotted a small hook-shaped cloud on the west side of the storm and something else that looked like a wave peeling off its eastern side. The Juno spacecraft also took an image of red flakes flying away from the spot. Researchers confirm that formations of various shapes actually detach from the Great Red Spot and scatter into space. These huge chunks, up to 100,000 kilometers in size, are about the size of Portugal or Iceland. Computer models show this is a very natural phenomenon for Jupiter's complex atmosphere. It may happen due to the convergence of the Great Red Spot and smaller storms. On Jupiter, anticyclones are attracted to other anticyclones, and opposites, such as cyclones and anticyclones, repel. The merging of anticyclones is a long process. In the beginning, a smaller storm becomes a small bulge closely adjacent to the larger hurricane. Then, the larger storm merges with the smaller one. But when anticyclones meet with cyclones, something different happens. A clockwise rotation of an anticyclone and a counterclockwise rotation of a cyclone first bring them to an abrupt halt. Then the motion resumes with an unimaginable force and scatters the storms in different directions. A small anticyclone wouldn't merge with the great red spot but shatter into pieces instead. And these pieces of different shapes would then separate from the storm. 
This is what astronomers believe they are observing. And the Great Red Spot is still shrinking. According to scientists' calculations, it could disappear in about 20 years. Jupiter is unlikely to be affected, but there may be some irreversible processes that the storm was preventing. Only time will tell what will happen when the storm completely disappears. Based on data from the Hubble telescope, the average wind speed around the red spot increased by 8% from 2009 to 2020. And this means the anticyclone isn't losing activity and may increase in size again. Or it could be replaced by another storm. In 2000, three small oval white vortexes on the planet merged together. And at the end of 2005, a new hurricane turned red. Astronomers called it the small red spot. In 2006, the small red spot came into contact with the great red spot. Because this was a slight collision, it didn't have any significant effect on the two whirlwinds. But how will the two storms get along in the future? To sort things out, NASA's mission Juno was extended for five years in 2021. The spacecraft will monitor mysterious polar cyclones, the planet's magnetosphere, and its incredible red storms. Jupiter continues to be studied by the Hubble and Webb Space Telescopes, as well as many ground-based observatories. It was April the 19th, 1971. The Soviet Union had just launched the world's first space station into low Earth orbit, named Salyut 1. Two months later, on June the 6th, 1971, the Soyuz would make a trip to the orbiting space station with cosmonauts Georgi Dobrovolosky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev aboard the spacecraft. The Soyuz 11 launched into space, and three cosmonauts boarded the Salyut 1 space station on June the 7th, 1971, without any trouble, and were there to carry out three weeks of experiments, such as growing Chinese cabbage and bulb onions taking spectrograms of stars and snapping some from-orbit photos of the snow and ice on the River Volga. They were now heroes, famous and plastered all over Soviet evening television. On June the 29th, 1971, with the cosmonauts' primary mission complete, the Soyuz 11 finally undocked from the Salyut 1, and three hours later, the spacemen fired their ship's engines to return to Earth. Vladislav Volkov joked with the flight control and asked them to make sure their traditional welcome home gift of cognac would be waiting for them at the landing site. At 29 minutes before touchdown, and at an altitude of 160 kilometers, explosive charges fired as planned to separate the Soyuz 11's orbital bell-shaped capsule and instrument modules. The space capsule was now the cosmonauts' only defense against the fiery furnace of re-entry. But then, something unexpected happened. As soon as the other modules were jettisoned, the pressure inside the crew capsule quickly fell, and all the air inside began escaping into the vacuum of space. Meanwhile, Mission Control was unaware of the situation. Attempts to contact the cosmonauts over VHF radio were met with an unnerving silence, and a sense of nervous unease crept into the room. 22 minutes before touchdown, the capsule was picked up on radar entering Soviet airspace. Mission controllers knew that because the spacecraft was still re-entering the atmosphere, it would be covered in a cocoon of plasma, and therefore communication would be impossible during this time. As the minutes went by, hopes for a happy ending were rekindled when the space capsule's drogue parachute automatically deployed, and then the larger main parachute canopy followed. However, there was still no word from the crew, and 10 minutes before touchdown, helicopter crews spotted the undamaged Soyuz 11 gently swinging back and forth under the perfect-looking parachute. Mission control was elated when the helicopter commander radioed that the capsule had landed safely. The recovery team was setting down nearby, and they were just minutes from opening the hatch and treating the cosmonauts to their cognac and other comforts of home after being in space for three long weeks. Within just two minutes of touchdown, the search and rescue team of two men reached the Soyuz 11 and then hammered on the ship's hull to let them know they were there. But there was no reply from inside. When they opened the hatch, a look of troubled uncertainty creased the face of one of the rescuers. Inside the capsule, the recovery team saw all three cosmonauts slumped over and motionless. Their faces were covered with dark spots that looked like bruises and blood was coming from their noses and ears. One of the spacemen, Dobrovolsky, was still warm, but attempts to revive him were unsuccessful. 
The first contact between the recovery crew and mission control took the form of three numbers, 111. This was code that represented the health of the cosmonauts. The number five stood for excellent condition, four was good condition, three meant that there were injuries, two meant that they were seriously injured, and one meant the injuries were fatal. So what happened? Based on the positions of the three cosmonauts' bodies upon their discovery, investigators came to the conclusion that Dobrovolsky and Volkov had untrapped themselves from their seats to try and find the leak that was allowing air escape from the capsule. Health trackers showed their heart rates soared as they searched, but time was not on their side, as within just 50 seconds, Patsayev's pulse dropped and his body became starved for oxygen. And within 110 seconds, all three cosmonauts had perished. Investigators had learned that a faulty valve was the cause of the space accident. Their funeral was epic on a grand scale, and the whole country mourned their passing. The Soviets halted all human spaceflights, while engineers redesigned the Soyuz spacecraft. All cosmonauts are now required to wear spacesuits during launches and landings. But Russia is not the only country to have had a space disaster that cost the lives of brave astronauts. The United States was leading the world in space travel with the ingenious engineering of the reusable space shuttle, but even the most advanced spacecraft can have problems. By January 1986, the United States seemed bored with spaceflight since the first space shuttle launch on April 12, 1981, and Americans were already used to the sight of the space shuttle launching. The program had experienced no trouble since its debut flight, but everything would quickly change. On the morning of January the 28th, 1986, the crew mission of STS-51L boarded the orbiter Challenger. It was a sunny but chilly Tuesday morning. All across the USA, people were a little more excited with this launch because the crew of seven astronauts included payload specialist Krista McAuliffe, who was a civilian, school teacher, and a mother of two children. She was part of the Teacher in Space project and proof that space was now wide open not just to Top Gun flighter pilots, but also the average American. The Challenger shuttle was commanded by Dick Scobie, with Michael Smith as the pilot, along with mission specialists Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, and Ronald McNair. The other payload specialist with Krista McAuliffe was Gregory Jarvis. At 11.38 a.m., the Space Shuttle Challenger lifted off from Cape Canaveral, Florida, with Krista McAuliffe on her way to becoming the first ordinary American to travel into space. But after just 73 seconds, and with hundreds of people on the ground watching, including Krista's family and a group of students, plus millions of viewers watching the launch on television, the space shuttle exploded into a ball of fire and smoke and disintegrated. So what happened? We mentioned it was a cold morning. In fact, there was ice on the tower two hours before the launch. An overnight measurement taken by the ICE team recorded temperatures on the left solid rocket booster at minus 4 degrees Celsius, and the right SRB was minus 13 degrees Celsius. However, these measurements were recorded for engineering data only and not reported, as the temperatures of the solid rocket boosters were not part of the launch commit criteria. Before we go on, it's important to know that the shuttle solid rocket boosters are made up of four segments bolted together at three O-ring joints. These O-rings are in place to maintain internal pressure of the SRB, and any failure of these O-rings would create a burn-through, causing a catastrophic failure. This is exactly what happened to the right solid rocket booster. There was a puff of black smoke from the right SRB at liftoff, showing that the O-ring had already failed. By the time the shuttle was in the air, flames started to come from the failed O-ring, and the sideways flame cut through the SRB like a cutting torch. The $1.2 billion spacecraft, its satellite payload, and the seven astronauts were lost instantly. The biggest factor in this accident was the cold. The launch itself was performed in minus 3 degrees Celsius weather, and engineers knew of the dangers posed to the O-rings at such low temperatures. However, despite many warnings from the engineers, the shuttle was cleared for launch. NASA shut down the Space Shuttle program for two years after this terrible tragedy, as its engineers redesigned many components of the shuttle. But it would not be the last Space Shuttle disaster. The Space Shuttle Columbia was the first shuttle to be launched into space in April 1981. The shuttle launched again 27 more times after its maiden voyage, and on January 16, 2003, it was on its 28th flight. The seven-member crew of mission STS-107 were mission commander Rick D. Husband, 
Pilot William C. McCool, Payload Commander Michael P. Anderson, Israeli astronaut Elon Ramon, serving as payload specialist, flight engineer Kalpana Chola, who had previously flown on mission STS-87, and U.S. Navy captains flying as mission specialists David M. Brown and Laurel Blair Sultan Clark. The launch seemed to go well and without problems. The astronauts were on a 16-day mission and successfully conducted around 80 science and research experiments, working 24 hours a day in two alternating shifts. It was now time for the crew to return home, and the Space Shuttle Columbia was scheduled to re-enter the atmosphere and land on February 1, 2003. At 2.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, the entry flight control team started its shift at Mission Control. Aboard the orbiter, the crew put away loose items and prepared for re-entry. Husband and McCool began working through the entry checklist, and at 1.10 p.m., the Columbia crew was approved to conduct their deorbit burn, which lasted 2 minutes and 38 seconds. At 1.44 p.m., Columbia re-entered the atmosphere at an altitude of 120 kilometers. Four and a half minutes later, a sensor began recording a greater than normal amount of stress on the left wing. But the sensor's data was sent to an internal recorder, and the crew or ground controllers didn't see it. The orbiter began to yaw to the left because of the increased drag. However, the orbiter's flight control system corrected the problem, and the crew never noticed the drag or what was happening. This was followed by sensors indicating problems in the left wing hydraulic systems and a loss of tire pressure on the left side landing gear. Columbia was flying at 60 kilometers above the Earth at a speed of 20,120 kilometers per hour when flight controllers received their last communications from the shuttle. Video from many witnesses watched in horror as the orbiter broke up and disintegrated. So what happened to Columbia and its crew? NASA's Intercenter Photo Working Group was looking over videos of the launch after Columbia entered orbit as a routine review. It wasn't until the second day that they discovered a piece of foam had broken off from the large external tank and impacted the left wing as the shuttle was climbing into orbit. The debris management team was unable to determine the damage caused to the left wing, and multiple requests for images were made to the U.S. Department of Defense. A request was relayed to the U.S. Strategic Command, which began identifying assets that could snap images of the orbiter. However, the image request was denied by NASA Mission Management Team Chair Linda Hamm after she discovered where the request came from. She asked a flight director about the imaging requirement, but not the debris assessment team. Moving the orbiter into a position to be imaged would have disrupted ongoing science operations, and Ham dismissed the Department of Defense's imaging capabilities as insufficient to assess damage to Columbia's left wing. Now here's where things get more interesting. Mission management downplayed the risk of the debris strike in communications with the Columbia crew, and flight director Steve Stitch sent an email to husband and McCool telling them of the strike and that there was no concern about damage since foam strikes occurred on previous flights. They also got a 15-second video of the debris strike, but were reassured that there was no danger. Obviously, they were wrong. No one knows the true extent of the damage to the wing, but members of the Columbia Accident Investigation Board performed a test using a space shuttle wing part and fired a chunk of foam at high speed at the same spot a chunk of foam hit Columbia's wing. And this is what happened. To the amazement of onlookers, the investigators blew a gaping 60-centimeter hole in the shuttle wing after firing a chunk of foam insulation at it. This was the smoking gun that proved that the damage from the debris strike led to Columbia's destruction and the loss of her crew. It was the last space shuttle launch, and the space shuttle program was permanently retired after this. Since then, astronauts have been getting into space with Russia's Soyuz program, and now SpaceX's rockets. That's all the time we have for now. We hope you found the video interesting and learned how brave our men and women who go into space are. Stay tuned here for more incredible space stuff and thank you for watching. The Earth was formed from a solar nebula about 4.5 billion years ago weighs 5,972 yottograms, and its radius is 6,371 kilometers. The numbers are so impressive that it seems that scientists have studied absolutely everything about our planet. But this is far from the case. 
We know a lot about what is on the surface of the Earth, but what is under the crust only raises questions. And to find answers to them, scientists go to any methods. What ancient planet is hidden inside ours? What sounds have scientists heard under the Earth's crust? And why did the deepest journey into the Earth stop? So, first things first. Our Earth consists of three main layers. The very first is the crust. This is the outermost layer of the planet. Its depth ranges from 5 to 75 kilometers. The thickest layers of the crust are on the continents, and the thinnest at the bottom of the oceans. The Earth's crust is made up of plates that constantly move at the rate at which our fingernails grow. This movement is due to the mantle, the next layer of the Earth. The depth of the mantle is about 2,890 kilometers. This layer consists of silicate rocks heated to temperatures of 900 degrees Celsius near the crust and up to 4,000 at a depth. When this incandescent substance bursts upward, volcanic eruptions occur. The last layer of the planet is the most mysterious. This is the core, the heart of our Earth. The radius of the core is about 2,180 kilometers. The inner core is solid and presumably composed of iron. The outer is liquid and consists of an alloy of nickel and iron. Also, the inner core rotates at a different speed than our planet. To study the secrets of the inner layers of our planet, scientists regularly take various measurements. During one such seismic tomography of our planet, scientists discovered something strange, namely the mysterious lumps floating inside the Earth's mantle. Some of these lumps combine to form large-scale regions. The two of the largest are located under Africa and under the Pacific Ocean. But something else is interesting. They don't just float harmlessly in the mantle of the planet, but create a unique anomaly. In particular, we're talking about the South African anomaly, which weakens the magnetic field of our planet. Serious changes in the magnetic field can lead to catastrophic consequences, up to a change in the poles. But the discovered anomaly, fortunately, is not so strong yet. However, what is the nature of its occurrence? And what are these mysterious clots that give rise to it? The mysterious substances are called LLSVPs, stands for Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces. They've existed for a huge amount of time, long before life appeared on Earth. And many scientists suggest that these are the remains of another ancient planet, which the Earth once collided with. According to this hypothesis, the planet Thea, which was similar in size to Mars, moved in a spiral trajectory through the solar system. It's impossible to calculate how fast the ancient protoplanet moved, however, our Earth became its final stop. If Thea hit the Earth at a right angle, or too sharp an angle, it would be a disaster, which most likely would entail the destruction of our planet. However, Thea hit the target perfectly, at a 45 degree angle. Thanks to this, our planet withstood, and just a piece broke off from it. Thea plunged deeply into our planet, and as a result, its core merged with the core of the Earth. After this collision, our planet received a sharp increase in rotation speed, one revolution in five hours, and a noticeable tilt of the rotation axis. Thanks to this, we got a change of seasons and a 24-hour day. A powerful split of the Earth's surface occurred, provoking a chemical exchange. This allowed the emergence and development of life on our planet in new conditions. That is, it is quite possible that it was thanks to the collision with Thea that humanity eventually emerged. In return of this gift, Thea chipped off a piece of Earth and took its place. But where did this mass thrown out of the planet go? If you look out the window in the middle of the night, you'll see the answer. Many scientists are confident that the Moon was part of our planet in the past and separated after the collision of Earth with Thea. The theory is supported by another amazing discovery that humanity made several decades ago. For this, let's go back in time to the late 1960s. The Soviet Union was not the only country that was first to send a person into space, but also the first to travel into the interior of the planet. For this, a large-scale project was created to drill the deepest well on Earth. It was named the Kola Superdeep Borehole SG-3. The initiator of the project was David Guberman, who devoted most of his life to the project. The drilling work progressed with great enthusiasm. It was possible to drill up to four meters per day, depending on the density of the rocks. Eight hours were spent on the lowering of the drilling tool, another eight on the drilling process itself. 
and the remaining eight for extraction of the rocks. Drilling proceeded relatively calmly down to 7,000 meters. Scientists did not encounter any difficulties, and the drill went through homogeneous solid granites. However, after a depth of 7,000 meters, the drill head entered the less durable bedrock. Regular accidents began to occur. However, scientists continued to work, and by 1983, the mark of 12,066 meters was reached. The project was put on a short pause. Immediately after the resumption of work, a terrible accident happened. The drill string broke off. Scientists were thrown back five years and continued to work from a depth of 7,000 kilometers. This mark turned out to be fatal for the project. Whenever scientists approached a depth of 12 kilometers, strange accidents occurred, and they had to start again from a depth of 7,000. According to scientists, it was almost impossible to work at a depth of 12 kilometers. The temperature rose above 200 degrees, and the resources of the equipment at that time were not enough. The deepest mark that scientists have been able to descend was 12,262 meters. In 1994, after another accident, the well was closed. The scientists who directed the experiment consider it to be incomplete. After all, the main goal was to reach the mark of 15 kilometers. It was assumed that after this depth, the drilling rig would be able to get to the Earth's mantle. If this project was completed, these discoveries could literally flip over all ideas about the structure of our planet, but they couldn't get through the last three kilometers. The Soviet Union collapsed, the project was no longer funded, and now the well is sealed with a strong iron hatch, according to David Guberman himself, so that curious stalkers do not throw stones into the well. However, it cannot be said that the experiment really failed. During their work, scientists managed to obtain a huge number of samples of the Earth from different depths to confirm several theories about the hydrodynamic zonal model of the Earth's crust, and also to make two amazing discoveries that are especially interesting to us. The first was overgrown with legends even before it actually happened. The Kola experiment was widely reported in the press, and one day, a Finnish newspaper published the news on April the 1st that the purpose of the well was to find the entrance to hell. This humorous news was immediately picked up by American newspapers, which began to talk about it in all seriousness. As a result, a legend has spread over the planet that when the well was drilled to a depth of 14.5 kilometers, they suddenly came out into some huge empty space. The temperature in this space reached 1100 degrees. Having lowered the microphone to this depth, the scientists recorded heart-rending human screams. American newspapers called it the screams of sinners tortured in the underworld, and years later, a supposedly real recording captured by microphones from that depth spread across the network. In fact, the story is the purest invention of a Finnish journalist, which the American media trustingly fell for. But we would not talk about this case if not for another mysterious situation that's associated with sounds. Here is a direct quote from academician Guberman himself, who supervised the experiment. When I'm asked about this mysterious story, I don't know what to answer. On the one hand, the stories about the demon are rubbish. On the other hand, as an honest scientist, I cannot say that I know exactly what happened here. Indeed, a very strange noise was recorded. Then there was an explosion. A few days later, nothing of the kind was found at the same depth. But another discovery has amazed the scientific part of society. As already mentioned, soil materials were regularly lifted from the depth of the well. Of particular interest were the samples raised from the depth of about three kilometers. After a thorough study of these materials, it turned out that they almost completely coincide with the materials of the soil brought by the American cosmonauts from the moon. Thus, the theory that the moon is part of the Earth, which broke away after a collision with Thea, became even more likely to be true. And these are far from all the discoveries that were made thanks to the Kola well. An analysis of the methods of its ultra-deep drilling helped several years ago to discover the real ocean of the Archean period by Russian, French and German scientists at a depth of 410 to 660 kilometers below the Earth. A huge body of water is located under the Earth's crust and was formed under conditions of high pressure and temperatures of 1530 degrees Celsius. The water in it is enclosed in the crystalline structure of minerals. 
And now, we cannot even guess whether these minerals contain any living organisms inside them. In order to find the answer to this question, you'll have to take another trip to the center of the Earth. But unfortunately, even if such a project is planned, there's no data on it yet. Therefore, for now, we can only find more and more questions to which there are no answers. But make sure to stay tuned here and we'll let you know when we find more answers to this and other incredible mysteries of our planet and the universe around us. We usually think of gravity as a force between objects with mass. It's easy to see how this force works by stepping on a scale to see how much you weigh. The number on the scale represents the Earth's gravity on your mass, or your weight on planet Earth. When it comes to gravity in the cosmos, we can imagine the Sun's gravity keeping the planets in their orbits, and we all know about the strong gravitational pull near a black hole. The so-called force of gravity is easy to understand, and gravity might seem like a simple thing after all. But things are different in the current age, as we know now that gravity as a force is only a small part of a more complex phenomenon thanks to the general theory of relativity. But before we get into that, it's time for a little Physics 101. Everyone is familiar with Newton, who was a veritable demigod of physics during his time, and the story about the apple falling on his head. Well, that didn't really happen. The truth is, Newton saw an apple fall from a tree and was in a contemplative mood. At that moment, he wondered why the apple fell straight towards the ground, and not sideways or in another direction. He presumed that a force of gravity between two bodies pulled them towards each other with a magnitude directly proportional to their mass, and also inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. The path that the bodies take will be the shortest to minimize energy use, therefore a straight line. In short, Newton believed an apple falls because a gravitational force accelerates it towards the ground. Newton probably thought there was something missing from his theory though, because it said he wasn't completely satisfied with it. This is because he originally thought of the force of gravity as a push, not a pull. Little did Newton know that he was partially right about this, but his theory of gravity was accepted as gospel that the magical pull was an essential property of mass, the theory which withstood and obscured the truth for the next 400 years. That was until Albert Einstein, another formidable genius, came along in 1905 and presented his general theory of relativity while working as a Swiss patent clerk. His challenge to Isaac Newton's theory was either ridiculed or ignored completely because his ideas seemed too radical to be possible. The key to understanding the theory of general relativity is that everything in a gravitational field falls at the same rate. But it wasn't Einstein that figured this out, it was Galileo that first concluded that all objects released together, in the absence of an atmosphere, will fall at the same rate regardless of their mass. A famous experiment by Apollo 15 astronaut David Scott was done on the moon to test this theory. At the same time, moonwalker astronaut Scott dropped a hammer and a feather, and they both glide to the ground and impact the ground at the same time. The same thing would happen for any object regardless of its mass or its physical makeup. This is known as the equivalence principle. So why do the two objects fall together and land at the same time? It's because they're not falling. They're standing still, and there is no force acting on them. With Einstein's theory, gravity is not a force between two objects with mass. Instead, gravity is the warping of space and time in the presence of objects with mass, and without some force acting upon the objects, they will travel in a straight line. Einstein believed smaller objects are not pulled on by more massive objects, but instead the objects are being pushed down by the space above them, and that there is no such thing as a gravitational force. According to Einstein's theory, matter warps not only the fabric of space, but time as well. This is called space-time, and any object in space warps this space-time continuum. Space-time is the three dimensions of space, length, width, and height, combined with the fourth dimension, time. The more massive the object, the more it warps the space around it. Einstein believed that apples fall from trees and planets orbit stars because the objects are moving along curves in the space-time continuum, those curves being gravity. A good example to see how this works is to visualize the Earth on a grid of space-time. 
You can see the mass of the Earth warps space-time and creates a kind of gravity well. Any object around this mass, you, me, and even the Moon, is pulled down and towards this gravity well. The Moon also warps space-time with its mass, but the gravitational field between the Earth and the Moon is not strong enough to pull the Moon towards us. Instead, it's also like an apple falling from a tree. The Sun also has a huge gravity well that keeps everything in our solar system from flying off into space. We can also understand how gravity wells around planets in our solar system work by how we've launched spacecraft. To get spacecraft moving in different directions from their launch path and increase their speed, engineers used warped space-time, or the gravity around other planets in our solar system, to get a gravitational slingshot that sends the spacecraft in another direction with greater speed. The closer to the planet, and therefore its gravity well, the faster the object will begin to move. What it all comes down to is that objects in the universe are attracted to each other because space-time is bent and curved. The closer they are to the object of mass, the faster they will accelerate. But what about this so-called gravitational field we were talking about earlier? Is it not a force? A gravitational field is actually the force field that exists in space around every object with mass. The Moon has a smaller gravitational field than the planet because of its mass. The Earth has a much stronger gravitational field over the Moon because of its mass. But in space, a gravitational field exists almost everywhere. With everything floating in space above our heads, it might be easy to believe there is no gravitational field at work in orbit around our big blue planet. However, even the International Space Station feels the gravity of Earth. The surprising thing is, the effect of gravity in orbit around the planet is nearly the same as the one on the surface of the planet. In fact, it's about 90% as much in orbit as on the surface of the planet. So if you weighed 100 kilograms on Earth and had a space ladder that reached all the way to the space station, you'd weigh about 90 kilograms up there. But wait a minute, if there is gravity in space around the planet, why do astronauts look like they're floating around in zero gravity? The reason astronauts look like they're floating in space is because everything, including the International Space Station, is falling together at the same time in the vacuum of space. This condition, in which it appears people and objects are weightless, is called microgravity. If everything falls in the same way regardless of its mass, then a free-floating astronaut far from any gravitational source and a free-falling astronaut in the gravitational field of a massive body would each have the same experience. In fact, the space station, satellites, and everything else up there is always falling towards the Earth. And while the International Space Station is falling, it's also moving very fast, at about 28,000 kilometers per hour from the pull of the Earth's gravitational force. There are some ways to prove Einstein is right about objects with mass warping the fabric of the universe called space-time. The gravitational acceleration at the Earth's surface is 9.81 meters per second. The reason gravity pulls you and other objects towards the ground has nothing to do with the core of the planet. All objects with mass bend and curve space-time, and that curvature of space is gravity itself. So if you were to somehow make a journey to the center of the planet, there would be no gravity. You would be away from the curvature of space-time at the center of an object with mass, and therefore floating around the core of the planet weightless. But as you started to make your way back to the surface, you'd start to feel the curvature of space-time from the mass of the Earth, and the effect of that curve, gravity, would start to get stronger. Of course, we'll have to get a probe to journey to the center of the Earth to nail that one down. But there is another way to prove that gravity warps space-time. One of these things is called gravitational lensing. This happens when a massive celestial body causes a big enough curvature of space-time that the light around the object appears visibly bent, as if you were looking at a camera lens. This gravitational lensing happens when the massive object, such as a galaxy, warps the space around it into rings of light. Interestingly enough, this has helped us find other galaxies and objects in space that we wouldn't otherwise see without the gravitational lensing effect. Einstein's cross is a famous example and shows a gravitationally lensed quasar that sits directly behind the center of a galaxy. Four images of Quasar appear in the foreground due to the strong gravitational lensing of the galaxy in the middle. 
it might seem like Einstein has this whole gravity thing locked down, and there is a lot of evidence to support general relativity. But here's the big problem. In its current form, it's incompatible with quantum mechanics. Quantum gravity is theoretical physics that seeks to describe gravity according to quantum mechanics. As of now, there's no such theory that is universally accepted and confirmed by experience. But that's not all. Researchers understand that at some point in a black hole, Einstein's theory breaks down and stops working. Scientists used three giant telescopes in Hawaii to watch a blue star called SO2 make its closest approach to the black hole Sagittarius A star in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy in its 16-year orbit. If Einstein's theory was right, the black hole would warp space-time and extend the wavelength of the light from the star. The waves of light would stretch out as the intense gravity of the black hole would drain their energy and cause the light from the star to shift from blue to red. And just as Einstein predicted, the star began to glow red. Had it been another color, it would have hinted at a completely different model of gravity altogether. Right now, scientists are looking for a curvature of space-time that is so extreme, the theory of general relativity fails. They believe that in the next 10 years, the theory of general relativity will be pushed to its limits, and another genius will come along and show us where Einstein was wrong. Let's hope we don't need to wait another 300 years. Scientists consider the Milky Way to be one of the oldest galaxies in the universe. It formed about 13.6 billion years ago, so it's almost the same age as the universe. To grow and mature, the Milky Way has merged with other galaxies, and it's now colliding with the dwarf galaxy Canis Major. This is how the Milky Way grew to a huge size, amounting to a diameter of 100,000 light years across. It consists of a central part and four large spiral arms, making our galaxy a barred spiral. The Earth is located in one of the quietest places, a small arm of Orion. The center of the Milky Way is located far away from our planet, at a distance of about 25,800 light years. There, as in the heart of any big city, life is in full swing. But because of the dense cloud of gas and dust, it's difficult to see, even with the most modern telescope. But what if we could move our planet there? As we'd approach the center of the galaxy, the ring of stars would shrink around us more and more. The Earth's magnetosphere would no longer protect us from radiation. Let's suppose that we somehow managed to pass through this area at a safe distance from supernova explosions that are common in such regions of space. It would still only get worse from there. We'd fall into the clutches of the supermassive black hole because there's no way we could bypass it. Even at a distance of 20 billion kilometers, this monster pulls everything inward at a speed of 25 million kilometers per hour. The path would lie through a dense cloud of gas and dust, the debris of stars which would probably blow the Earth into pieces before being swallowed by the black hole. So it's better we stay in our quiet and cozy arm of Orion and study the center of the Milky Way through the help of telescopes. But for a long time, scientists couldn't break through the dense cloud of gas and dust. So the existence of the supermassive black hole lurking in the middle of the galaxy was just an assumption. It was only confirmed with theoretical calculations. Observations also showed that stars are attracted to the center of the galaxy by an incredible massive object. However, any image of the black hole was just a computer simulation. To get a real image of it, 300 researchers from 80 scientific institutions around the world created a powerful Event Horizon Telescope. It connected eight radio observatories around the globe, forming a single visual telescope the size of the Earth. But this was just the beginning of the hunt for Sagittarius A star. To understand all the complications, let's go back to the black hole from the M87 galaxy. The mass of the giant is 6.5 billion solar masses. The accretion disk makes a rotation around its center with a span of several days or weeks. Sagittarius A star is much smaller, and its accretion disk has an orbital period of just a few minutes. So the brightness and structure of the black hole's halo change at an incredible rate, which prevented astronomers from capturing an image of Sagittarius A star. To succeed, researchers have developed new sophisticated algorithms and programs. Then, for weeks, they collected data on the black hole. The information received was processed using a supercomputer. 
The result was a stunning shot of the massive black hole. However, this region of the Milky Way keeps surprising scientists. The most astonishing discoveries were made by the new generation radio telescope Meerkat, located in South Africa. The whole thing consists of dozens of antennas that widen the telescope's field of view. As a result of 144 hours of observations on Meerkat and 70 terabytes of processed data, astronomers created this unprecedented image. This is what the center of our galaxy would look like if people could see radio waves. This is a very detailed picture, and every object in it is kind of a mystery. This is a spherical supernova explosion, and here, on the right, you can see an unknown object that looks like a comet with a bright tail. However, it's not a comet, but something still unknown to astronomers. Another interesting tailed radio source is also visible nearby. It probably moves at an extremely high speed, and as a result leaves a trail behind it. Here, a mysterious mini spiral sticks out of a black hole. According to scientists, it may be a stream of ionized gases rushing into space from the depths of Sagittarius A star. And this image illustrates a much larger and quite bizarre object. Giant magnetic tentacles extend from the core of the Milky Way. Astronomers believe they stretch for 150 light years. These tentacles resemble threads arranged in pairs or groups, like strings on a harp. And they're separated from each other by about one astronomical unit. These peculiar cosmic wires are pierced with electrons accelerated to near the speed of light. The mysterious filaments were first discovered back in the 1980s, and the new Meerkat image uncovered thousands of new ones. This is ten times more than previously discovered. Finding these cosmic wires was a difficult task, as they strongly merge with other objects in the center of the galaxy. But Meerkat can detect synchrotron radiation, or radio waves generated by the movement of charged particles at near light speed. Combined with software imaging processing, the advanced technology eventually made it possible to catch the threads on camera. Astronomers named these structures after the terrestrial creatures they resemble – pelicans, mice, and snakes. But the secret behind the origin of this galactic menagerie remains a mystery. The filaments may have been created by the magnetic fields of excited gases escaping from the black hole. They're intertwined with starbursts and supernova explosions. It turns out the galactic filaments are enclosed in cocoons, two giant bubbles that emit radio emissions. These 1400 light-year arrays extend from the black hole in opposite directions, forming two halves of an hourglass, with the black hole at its narrowest point. The thread-filled bubbles look like carefully woven, exquisite pieces of cosmic art, and they probably appeared millions of years ago as a result of a severe cosmic cataclysm. Astronomers consider several options for what might have happened. A squall that rose after the simultaneous explosion of many stars could have filled this region of space with a huge amount of energy. Or a black hole swallowed nearby stars too fast and let some of the gases out. But regardless of what happened, the disaster was on an enormous scale. It provoked a colossal surge of energy that pierced the interstellar medium and gave birth to gas bubbles. The electrons inside them are still in an excited state, and together with nearby magnetic fields, they emit radio waves. Still, these structures are like little soap bubbles compared to giant Fermi bubbles, which were discovered in 2010 and stretch above and below the galactic center by as much as 50,000 light years. They're millions of times more massive than the Sun, and emit gamma rays at a higher energy level than the Milky Way. A decade later, with the help of the Wisconsin H Alpha Mapper Telescope, astronomers learned more about the Fermi bubbles. Researchers found ions in them that formed as a result of an intense light flash. The event happened about 3.5 million years ago, but the gas in the bubbles is still about 8,500 Kelvin. With new data, scientists hope to test models of the Fermi bubbles against observations. In 2020, the E. Rosita Telescope discovered another pair of bubbles. The E. Rosita bubbles are also hourglass-shaped, and they're visible in the X-ray range. 
The image here shows a comparison of the Fermi and Erosita bubbles. Both look quite similar, and although they could have originated from the same cosmic catastrophe, scientists are certain that these are different pairs of bubbles. It's possible that the black hole Sagittarius A star sucked in a massive cloud of hydrogen and then ejected a huge amount of energy. Another idea is that there was an explosion of a huge array of stars. Bubbles could also be born as a result of both events working in tandem. According to Andrew Fox of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Maryland, in the latter case, the flash would have had unprecedented power and lit up the entire galaxy like a Christmas tree. Astronomers hope to confirm this version soon. Erosita is currently completing its second visible sky scan. Perhaps the new data could reveal the clues behind the nature of the mysterious bubbles. Meanwhile, another team of astronomers is trying to explain a cosmic event that's already on the verge of mysticism. Strange radio signals are being sent to us from the center of our galaxy. In 2021, astronomers picked up these signals with the ASKAP radio telescope in Australia. The signals were intermittent, lasting 15 minutes a day for several weeks. Then the obscure galactic signals went silent. Later, they were spotted again by the Meerkat radio telescope. Astronomers have detected six signals within nine months of 2020. What's weird is that their radio frequency didn't match any frequency known to science. Astronomers were also amazed by the high polarization of space signals. This means that the electrical signal of radio waves was restricted to a single direction. Scientists looked for explanations, and they considered pulsars, which are rapidly rotating neutron stars. Pulsars are magnetized and emit strong radio emissions, but the unknown signals didn't correspond to the type of such celestial objects. Magnetars didn't work as an explanation either. Their radio spectrum is quite different from that coming from the galactic center. So far, astronomers have settled on the idea that these were the signals from a new type of stellar object, still unknown to science. The phenomenon has some common properties with other unexplained signals, galactic center radio transients. Three such signals were identified in the 2000s, but the source of the GCRTs are also poorly studied so it's still too early to talk about their common nature. Collisions of galaxies do not happen often, but when it does happen, the process plays an important role in the evolution of the universe. When galaxies collide, rotating stars meet each other, and their motion slows. The glow from the collision will be of such intensity that even billions of years later, astronomers millions of light years away will see echoes of this event in the sky. In a collision of galaxies, there are two scenarios for the development of events. The first is the most common. It happens when galaxies are moving towards each other at a very slow speed. The process of their collision takes millions of years. The collision will not necessarily be head-on, but instead a merger, and galaxies may pass at a close range or just slightly touch each other. But even from such insignificant contact, both galaxies will be deformed. With such a contact, energy is released and masses moved, many times exceeding any numbers that our imagination can picture. When galaxies come into contact, tidal forces arise. They stretch the circumference of galaxies in length and bend them. They also set in motion clouds of gas and dust. These clouds thicken over time, and as a result, new planets and stars are formed. Therefore, when galaxies merge, they do not destroy themselves. How do we know all this? As it was already mentioned, galaxies have already collided repeatedly in the universe. And one of these collisions can be seen right now. The European Southern Observatory was able to record the collision of two galaxies in the constellation Aquarius, 89 million light years from the Milky Way. According to astrophysicists, the collision has been going on for 40 million years. Judging by the stellar streams in the peripheral regions, the result of this collision will be a complete merging of galaxies. That's why terrestrial telescopes will not see a huge fire show with a collision of planets in distant space. Therefore, it does not threaten anything on Earth. After all, even in the case of a more explosive collision of galaxies, we're too far away. But there are, of course, other cases. If at a speed of approach of 200 kilometers per second, the galaxies most often merge, and at 600, they pass through each other, 
Then, at speeds above 1,000 kilometers, the consequences will be fatal. There will no longer be any tidal forces or new cloud formations. A collision of stars will occur, a chain reaction will be triggered, and galaxies will be torn to shreds. The scale of such a disaster is simply unimaginable. Humanity has never seen such pictures close up. However, we will one day become a part of such an event, the moment the Andromeda Galaxy collides with our home galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy is heading towards us at an insane speed of 120 km per second. It's not known if this speed will change in the future. Both galaxies are roughly the same size. This means that the result of the collision is unpredictable, but scientists still have time to guess what it will be like. Previously, it was assumed that the collision would occur in 5 billion years. However, according to the latest computer visualizations, the deadline has changed. Scientists are now confident that the collision will occur in a maximum of 4 billion years. It'll take that long for the galaxies to go through a full collision cycle and arrive at its conclusion. After 3 billion years, the light of the Andromeda galaxy can be seen from Earth with the naked eye. And after 4, the solar system will already be the neighbor of Andromeda. Moreover, it's not a fact that the merger of galaxies will not happen earlier. But what exactly will happen when galaxies collide? Scientists speak of two options. The first is the merging of the two systems. This scenario was modeled by American theoretical astrophysicists Avi Liob and Thomas Cox. If the collision occurs in 4 billion years, then the process of merging will happen in 10. Both galaxies will approach each other and their mutual attraction will begin to pull them into an oblong shape. After that, the galaxies will pass through each other, but then the mutual attraction will again pull them back. This is how a new elliptic supergalaxy will appear. This galaxy has already been given a name, Milkomeda. But what happens to the planets and stars when they merge? If everything happens according to the first scenario, then no explosions of stars will happen. The merging speed will be too slow, and the distance between the stars will be enormous. For example, the closest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, is 4.22 light years from Earth. This is 277,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. With such a huge distance between objects, the likelihood of a direct collision is extremely small. Of course, isolated cases may occur, but they're unlikely to affect our solar system. Nevertheless, the explosions are unavoidable. After the merging of galaxies, new stars will begin to appear, white and blue giants. These giant stars have a relatively short lifespan because their fuel reserves are rapidly running out. And when they're gone, these stars will explode. This process could be fatal for the galaxy because the explosions of stars will push interstellar gas out of it. It is the building block for the emergence of new stars that are the galaxy's fuel. Therefore, left without material for the formation of new stars, the galaxy will be doomed. But this is not important. After all, according to the calculations of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research in Western Australia, the newly formed galaxy will be doomed anyway. As you know, in the very centre of our Milky Way, there is a supermassive black hole. It's four million times more massive than our Sun. There's a similar black hole in the centre of the Andromeda Galaxy. These are two frightening and unexplored objects that have powers beyond the scope of the human mind. And, when the merging of two galaxies occurs, the collision of black holes will be inevitable. First, they'll spiral in the interior of the newly formed galaxy. And then, after 16 billion years, they will merge. As a result of the joining of two objects with such a gigantic mass, there'll be an emission of gravitational radiation of incredible scale. The excitation of the space-time moving at the speed of light. The galaxy's gas will heat up to trillions of degrees, and the substance will burn out very quickly. And, left without it, the galaxy will go out, transformed into lifeless darkness, enveloping black holes merged together. The Earth, of course, will die along with the entire galaxy. However, according to astrophysicists from the Russian Academy of Sciences, there is another option. Perhaps the collision of galaxies will provoke an alternative scenario. The force of gravity will work against our solar system, will feel an extraordinary acceleration, and then our system will literally be thrown out from outside the Milky Way galaxy. We will fly in an unknown direction. We will move at an unknown speed through the chaos of stars. 
The beautiful starry sky above our head will gradually fade away, and it'll be replaced by cosmic darkness. However, there will be a chance that even with this scenario, our system will survive. After all, the Sun's magnetosphere will protect it from intergalactic radiation, but will it save the inhabitants of the Earth? Speaking of which, we completely forgot. What will happen to humans because of the collision of two galaxies? According to astrophysicists, the fate of humanity in this story is extremely pessimistic. And it's not only due to the very fact of the collision. If the collision occurs in 4 billion years, as scientists expect, then this will not be the main cause for concern among Earthlings. After all, the main headache at the moment for us will be our Sun. In about 1 to 2 billion years, the Sun will become so hot and large that all the water from our planet will evaporate. Well, perhaps at that time, humanity will already figure out how to live on the planet without using water. But the problems don't end there. In another billion years, the Earth's surface will become so hot that metals will melt on it. And if at that time there are still living people on the planet, they'll obviously have a hard time. But any other form of life that survives all these events on Earth will be able to observe the collision of galaxies. In any case, the Sun will sooner or later put an end to the abuse of the Earth. The transformation of the Sun into a red giant is irreversible. When the Sun turns 12 billion years old, most of the Earth will be lost into space, and all that remains will turn into a lava ocean. The Sun will swallow Mercury and Venus, becoming larger and larger. The Moon will also grow, but only for the Earth's tidal influence to rip it apart and turn it into the planet's ring system. And even if the Earth is not absorbed by the Sun, it'll turn into a dead, flaming planet, surrounded by a ring of space debris under the flaming gaze of the red giant inside a new supergalaxy. And our planet Earth will never again be a blue oasis in a dark, lifeless space. Its appearance will change forever, and nothing will remind you that there was once life here. Therefore, regardless of whether the Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxies will collide once or simply pass by each other, nothing will really change for humanity. By the time of the collision, we will have to leave our home planet and get as far away as possible. Farther from the moment when the solar system will be thrown out of the galaxy, when the sun turns into a red giant and destroys our planet, and when two supermassive black holes of two galaxies merge together. But fortunately, all this will not happen very soon. Therefore, we still have time to admire the beautiful starry sky and watch how new space missions are sent into it, bringing closer the moment of the great emigration of mankind from Earth. We hope you enjoyed the video and be sure to stay tuned here for more exciting things happening in our universe. Thanks for watching.